Hi, and welcome to Nutshell Physics. These videos are designed to teach you everything you need to know and be able to do for exam success at advanced level secondary school physics. I have or will be creating separate playlists on my channel for the different A-level boards and for IB. They are a work in progress, so if you don't see what you need, it will be there soon. I hope you find these helpful. If there's anything you would particularly like me to cover or a question you'd like me to answer, leave a comment and I'll do my best. Okay, vectors and scalars. You've done some of this at GCSE before. You should know basically the difference between a vector and a scalar, but we will go through it briefly. The difference at A level is that what they expect you to do is to be able to work with vectors. Um, you need to be able to take a vector and break it into its component parts, and you also need to be able to add two vectors together. So just to start us off, let's talk about what the difference between vectors and scalars are, and we're going to use speed and velocity to highlight that difference. So 400 meter runner and world champion Alison Felix. She starts running at right there on the inside lane of a 400 meter track and she runs around 400 meters and she does it in 40.82 seconds. So the distance that she travels is 40, 400 meters and she does it in 40.82 seconds. A typical question you might ask yourself well, is, what is her speed? The problem is that, that is too basic a question here because we can't say what her speed is with just that information. Her speed is not constant as she runs around this track. So you'd have to be more specific. What is her speed at a particular time? What we can do is we can say what her average speed for the whole trip was. And that's simple enough. It is distance divided by time. And so we would simply find the answer of 400 meters divided by 40.82 seconds. Note, if she ran in a straight line or she ran around the track, it would make no difference here because she's still covering 400 meters and she still, still does it in the same amount of time. And this is the difference with velocity. So when Alison runs around the track and all the way back to where she began, the displacement that she has covered is zero. So she's actually covered zero meters displacement because she's come back to where she started and she's done that in 40.82 seconds, which means that her average velocity for that trip would be zero meters per second. And this is the difference here, that with velocity, it matters what direction you're going in. And so while Alison was indeed moving and she did have a speed and a velocity at all points along the track, it, because she effectively ran in one direction and then ran back the way she came in the other direction, her total displacement and therefore her total velocity are zero. This is effectively the difference with a vector, the direction matters. With a scalar, it does not. It's like the difference between the total number of steps that you do every day versus where you're actually headed. Or, to give it, think of it another way, if you were trying to do orienteering without being given compass bearings. So the distance means nothing if you don't have a direction attached. So this is what makes vectors so powerful. They give us more information. Officially, this is what a scalar is. It has magnitude only. It has an amount. A direction is not necessary or sometimes even relevant for it. For example, as we've said, distance and speed. Time is also a scalar quantity. Although time can go forwards and backwards, it makes no sense to say a video lasted 25 minutes at 30 degrees. These things are meaningless. Uh, contrast that with vectors. It has both the magnitude and the direction, so you still need the number. So, for example, speed is the number that goes with velocity. Speed is the magnitude of velocity. But with velocity, we must always put in a direction as well. Which direction are you headed in when you have the speed? And if you change your direction, you change your velocity. Now, let's look at an example and take this situation when you go around in a circle. So, let's suppose you start up here and you travel half of a circle all the way down to the bottom. We can do a calculation of both speed and time. So let's suppose it takes you seven seconds to go from one place to another. What distance have you traveled? Well, the distance that you traveled is going to be half of the circumference of the circle, so it's going to be 12.5 meters. And you're going to do that in seven seconds, giving you 
an average speed of 1.79 meters per second. What about your velocity? Well, we know that the actual displacement from your starting point is that. And that's going to be twice the radius. And so if we do the calculation and we say 2 pi r is equal to 25 meters, because that's what the circumference of the circle is, then our r should be 3.98 meters. And 2r would be 3.98 times 2, which gives us 7.96 meters. Divide that again by your 7 seconds, and you end up with 1.14 meters per second. So this is vector AB. It could be force, it could be velocity, it could be momentum. It doesn't really matter because all vectors are treated the same way. And this is the notation. It mentions notation in our specification, so we need to be able to recognize that this is what vector notation looks like. It gives from A to B, and the little arrow over it means that this is a vector. Now, how do you find the magnitude of this vector? Well, it's fairly simple and straightforward. You take a ruler, and you simply measure the length of the arrow. One, two, 2.4 centimeters. Remember, that is simply the magnitude of this. In terms of finding the direction of the vector, what we would normally do, and you wouldn't have a ruler that had a zero in it like this, but what you would normally do is you would find the angle that it makes with the horizontal and find out what theta is. And in this case, we know that theta is 23 degrees. You would have to use a protractor for that. Okay, let's talk about adding vectors together. There are two ways that you need to be able to do this. Um, the first way is using drawing like this. So, if the vectors are not at right angles to each other, the only way that you're expected to have to add the vectors together is by drawing. Um, and it's a fairly simple process, but it just it takes time and it's fiddly. So the first thing you have to do is you look at your vectors and you measure the length of vector b. Here, and the length of vector b is 3.6 centimeters. And it's at zero degrees. The golden rule here is tip to tail. So when you're adding these vectors together, you have to make sure that you join them tip to tail. And the idea is you then move vector B up here. You keep it at the same angle, right to the tip of vector A. That's the tip. And this is the tail of vector B. And you draw 3.6 centimeters. One, two, three, six. Add in your little arrowhead there. And then the next job you have to do is you join the absolute ends of your vectors. Now, unfortunately, with this program, you only really have, can't do it completely accurately, but what you then do is you join the tail of A to the tip of B. Not perfect there. You'd be able to do that better if you were doing it on paper. You then measure the length of B, I'm oh, sorry, your vector AB when it's joined together. That would be 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6.9. And you measure the angle. This one is at 15, centimeter, 15 degrees to the horizontal. So not theta in this case. It's 15 degrees to there. That is how it's done. There are some examples of this, but it doesn't tend to be asked at A level. It's asked more often at AS level. What if you have two vectors that are like this, where they start at the same origin? Our original example, they were two separate ones. We were going to add them together. But what about if they start like this? 
Well, we're doing the same thing. We're going to take this 5 centimeter vector here, and we're going to take the tail of it, which is down there, and we're effectively going to slide that tail up along the 4 centimeter vector up to there and redraw it. We're effectively making a parallelogram. So if I look at the angle that my 5 centimeter vector is at, and it's at 5 degrees, and I just go up here, keep it at 5 degrees, and make sure I make it 5 centimeters long. And then my 4 centimeter vector is at 20 degrees, and I should find that when I put my ruler at 20 degrees here, that it joins up the rest of my parallelogram. It's a little tricky to do on this computer program there. To find the resultant of that, this vector then, I simply join up the corners. And again, it might be quite tricky because of the resolution of this ruler, but I will do my best here. And I need to know the length of that. So starting at the corner, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, point 8 centimeters. That's the magnitude of my resultant. For the angle of my resultant, I know this is at 6 degrees to the horizontal, my 5 uh, centimeter vector was at 5 degrees to the horizontal, so the difference between the, that is going to be 11 degrees. So my resultant is 8.8 .8 centimeters at 11 degrees from the original 5 centimeter uh, vector. What about those that are at 90 degrees to each other? Well, let's draw in a vector here, and we'll make it a fixed length. 1, 2, 3, 4, Let's make it interesting and say it's 5.4. And we'll make this one 1, 2, 3.5. So what is the resultant of this one? This one we can just straightforward use Pythagoras. So this isn't a problem here. We simply, we know it's a right angle triangle. And so we use Pythagoras that the hypotenuse squared is equal to the sum of the squares of the other two sides. The next thing that we need to be able to do is to take a vector and do what's called resolving. Now resolving means, if you look at this vector here, and we'll call it vector A, it is off at an angle. Um, and vectors at an angle make it very difficult for us to calculate with. So what we like to do is we like to be able to break them into their horizontal and vertical components. Again, imagine this is like a treasure map, and that's where your treasure is. In order to get to the treasure, you might tell someone, okay, I want you to walk X number of steps east to there, and then I want you to walk X number of steps north. So what you're doing is you're breaking up the angled direction into two easy steps. And that's exactly what we're going to do here. So when you want to resolve a vector by drawing, all you do is you take your ruler, and from the point of your vector, you drop a line vertically down onto the x-axis, taking its y-coordinate, and you draw a line here, and you measure what its distance along the x-axis is. So the horizontal component of this vector is 1, 2, 3, 4.7 centimeters. Again, I have to round there because of my instrument. 4.7 centimeters, and the vertical component is 1, 2, 3, 4. And it's as simple as that. The other way of breaking a vector into its horizontal and vertical components or resolving a vector is to use some trigonometry. And this is the one that by far is used the most often. Because 
we are much more comfortable in doing the calculation. We do not really want to be spending our, our time drawing out vectors on graph paper so that we can drop down to horizontal and vertical parts. So we, we do this, and we'd say, OK, we need to know the angle. Um, we could be given either angle, but of course, this whole part here is a 90 degree angle. So even if we were given this part in here, we could figure out what this is. And we're going to say, right, that's my vertical component. That is my horizontal component. Now we know that the sine of theta is opposite over hypotenuse. And that means that the sine of theta here is going to be b over 6.7. So sine 23 is equal to b over 6.7. And that means that b is equal to sine of 23 times 6.7. That gives us b being 2.62. Equally, we can say that the cos of 23 is going to be equal to the adjacent side, which here we're calling h, our horizontal component, over our hypotenuse, which is 6.7, which means h, then, is equal to cos of 23 times 6.7, 6.17. Either way will work. If you do it out, draw it out beautifully to scale with the angle in, and you drop it down to the x-axis and the y-axis, and you measure those, you will get answers approximately the same as those, depending on how sharp your pencil is, effectively, and how accurate you are with your drawing, and also the resolution of your protractor. Obviously, it is, in general, much more accurate to be able to calculate it, even when you do the rounding of the final significant figure. These two here. Finding the vertical component using sine, and finding the horizontal component using cos, these are extremely important. These are the ones you're going to be using an awful lot. And eventually, we just default into using any vertical component, as long as this is the angle that you're working with. Any vertical component is going to be hypotenuse sine theta. Any horizontal component is going to be hypotenuse cos theta. Let's check back in with our specification points, see what we need to know and whether we do in fact know them. So understanding scalar and vector quantities and know examples of each type of quantity, check. To find the resultant of vectors at any angle to each other by drawing, and then at right angles to each other by calculation, we've done that. And to be able to resolve a vector into its components at right angles to each other, so it's horizontal and vertical components, both by drawing dropping to the axes, and by calculation, using sine and cos, check. So that's our first three specification points covered for A-level.